as 2023 comes to a close, it is time for a raw, no-holds-barred reflection on the investment battlefield. We run the year through our heads and ask ourselves what we could have done different, better, or maybe what we shouldn't have done at all. Be honest. We spent way too much time this year hostage to a Federal Reserve hanging on every word out of Jay Powell's mouth. Don't fight the Fed. That's been the rallying cry all year. Well, those who fought the Fed, they won. Let's stop peddling the same old market mantras that are about as reliable as the weather. Yes, the broad macro matters, and maybe affects our positioning around the edges. But in the end, it is a market of stocks with individual stories, fundamentals, and management teams. What worked, what didn't, and what's next? Those are the questions we have to answer. We all watched this year as the Magnificent Seven stocks carried the broad indices back up close to a 52-week high and within earshot of an all-time high. Fabulous companies all, but difficult to concentrate all your capital into just a handful of relatively expensive companies. But was that the only path forward? Let's find out. Welcome to The Money Runner. I'm David Nelson. You know the names. Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Amazon, Meta, NVIDIA, Tesla. Investors hid behind the belief that any underperformance was because market returns were so narrow. How could we possibly be expected to keep up? Well, to that end, a lot of long strategies did fail to keep up. Those who had a short bias, they had their heads handed to them. Even a lot of market timing and tactical strategies struggled to deliver competitive returns. Look, there are always exceptions, and of course some did outperform, but the truth is a bitch. We can no longer hide behind the Elite 7 and blame our returns on the monster outperformance of these fabulous companies. Do the math. 25% of the S&P 500 is up more than the index this year. That's more than 125 companies with better than 20% returns. 60% of the index is positive year-to-date. Even the maligned Russell 2000, which isn't having a great year at the index level, has some big winners. 17 are up better than NVIDIA. More than 500 beat the S&P 500. Downside protection always comes with a price tag. Using strategies that protect the downside almost always means you will lag the upside. Nothing wrong with that. Constructing a portfolio that keeps you in the game is better than not playing the game at all. But be honest about your returns. And don't pass the blame onto a handful of stocks you may not own. I said earlier... We spend way too much time worrying about the Federal Reserve and the macro challenges we face almost every year. We worry about the Fed because they have a propensity to make mistakes. I get it. Just about every recession was on the heels of a Federal Reserve tightening too far into the cycle or failing to anticipate a recession on their doorstep. This last run-up in the market is the realization that the Fed is done. I'll say it once again. We can debate the timing of a cut. We can even debate that there will be a cut. But what isn't up for debate is that the Fed is done, and if they aren't, there will be hell to pay. No, I'm not going to attempt to give you a year-end target. It's a fool's game and almost always wrong. All of the bulge bracket firms will adjust their targets as the year comes to a close, and miraculously, they'll get it right by Christmas. Look beyond the Magnificent Seven. There are just too many stories and opportunities to to ignore. We've already shown that you could have beaten the market even if you didn't own any of these stocks. Yeah, it was easier with them, but not impossible. 
lightning rarely strikes twice in the same place. We could easily see some profit taking after the year end. Remember January this year? Some of the biggest losers were last year's winners. When we closed out 2022, a lot of this year's winners were for sale. Most were down hard on the year. You couldn't sell enough Microsoft to keep your head above water. I suspect investors with big profits and large cap secular growth that need to cash in will likely wait till after the start of the new year. How much they decide to sell could set the tone for January and beyond. If you like the podcast today, hit subscribe. Like always, let us know what you think. If you think I got it wrong, shout it out. I promise to get back to all those who comment or have a question. And don't forget the interview series. Go visit my last interview with Michael Gayet. You'll be glad you did. Thanks for joining. I'm David Nelson. 